The peace of God to all of you that are watching right now, whether you are watching it live, whether you're watching it after the fact, may God give you peace. May God give you wisdom, may he give you understanding concerning everything that we'll be discussing in today's talk. This is your brother David Williams and the Spirit of the Lord wants you to be ready and available to do everything that you are called of God to do. The Spirit of God wants you to be ready and available. He wants you to be prepared. Prepared. He wants your time to be according to your calling. The Spirit of God wants your time to be scheduled. He wants your schedule to be consistent with his calling on your life. That means he's got expectations for you and he desires that you fulfill those expectations. He's willing to give you the knowledge and the power necessary to fulfill those expectations. One of the things that's so interesting about what we're studying here in Exodus chapter 4 as we're looking at Moses' encounters with the Spirit of God as Moses is encountering the Spirit of God for the first time in his life. This is his first major encounter with the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is delivering him in this moment from the fear delivering him from anything that would hinder his ability to serve God in power, whatever would hinder him from serving God according to God's will for his life. The Lord wants to address that in the first meeting, in the first meeting. We know that Jesus likes to do that. That's his way. That's what he desires. That's why Jesus came preaching repentance. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so the message of repentance by Jesus is not to strip you of one thing without endowing you with something else. So Jesus doesn't want to take away your sinful nature without also giving you power to operate in the new nature and without giving you the power to transform your world as heaven. So it is your response. So Jesus delivers you from lust and pride and rebellion so that he can give you, uh, what does it say in Second Timothy? Uh, power, love, and a sound mind. Why does Jesus deliver me from rebellion? So that I can operate in submission to the extent of the miraculous, to the extent of the grace of God flowing in and through my life. So God will free me from bondage to sin so that I can operate in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost unto bringing great deliverance to those who need deliverance and we all need deliverance. So the Spirit of God wants to make you fully able to do the job that he's ordained you to do. God doesn't just want you to do your job. God wants you to do your job well. There's a standard for how well you do your job. So you're not just doing your job. There's a standard. You've got to do it well. And the Spirit of God has to describe what that looks like. God wants to reveal how you're supposed to do your job so that you uh, please the Father, so that you are pleasing. So in Exodus chapter 4, the Spirit of God is demonstrating some miracles for Moses. He's demonstrating some miracles. He's telling Moses this is how you're going to reveal the fact that I'm with you. This is what you're going to do. So he's walking him through the miraculous. He's, he has Moses throw his staff on the ground. The staff becomes a serpent. Moses grabs the serpent by the tail because the Lord tells him to. The staff becomes, or the serpent becomes a staff. Moses, take your hand, put it in your bosom. It's leprous. Moses, take your hand, put it back in your bosom. Puts it in there. It's healthy. If they don't believe that, then Moses takes some water from the river, pour it on the ground. It becomes blood. The Lord tells Moses that, or he's allowing Moses to experience the power. 
Moses, you don't believe that I want to do this, so I'm going to show you that I want to do this. You're, you're doubting that I want to do this, and so I want you to experience this right now. I want you to experience right now what I'm going to do for you in your future. And so your transition from carnal-minded fearfulness to confident humility is 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 while it's gradual it's significant it's serious it's it's one it's amazing what am i saying i'm saying that in order for you to fulfill the will of god for your life there has to be a confidence but there is a difference between confidence and pride pride is self will confidence essentially good courage and good confidence is when you know the will of god and you are devoted to doing it you know the will of god you're devoted to doing it you're not afraid of doing what the spirit of god wants you to do that's confidence when you are when you trust that you've heard from God, you believe that you are called to do what it is that you're doing, that's confidence. Pride is when you desire to do something, whether it's the will of God or not, you still want it accomplished. You don't really care who says what. Obviously, there are various types of pride, but pride is when you are confident in yourself, independent of God, apart from God, separate from God, Confidence in God or, or, or faith is when you are aware of God and God's will for your life. So the Spirit of God wants you to operate in confidence. He wants you to operate in faith. He wants you to operate in faith. And so what he can do for you to encourage you in your calling is he, is he can allow you to experience what the anointing on you does. So in private, so here Moses is with the Lord alone and he's experiencing what the power of God does. Without Moses going to the elders yet, Moses hasn't met up with Aaron. He's not gone to Pharaoh yet. He's with God. The angel of the Lord is appearing there and the Lord is walking Moses through what Moses is going to be operating in. So the men of God get to sample, all right? He gets to sample what God is doing because he's not sure what God is doing. He's doubtful. He's, he's not confident that the Spirit of God really wants to work through him. He just doesn't believe that. It's just not something he's comfortable with. He doesn't believe God wants to work through him in this way. But the Spirit of God does want to work through him in this way. And so what he does for Moses is he allows Moses to experience his power, the power of God. Moses, since you don't believe that I'm going to give you power, let's work with that. Let's practice. Let's practice. Yeah, practice is good. Practice is good. And we know the Spirit of God lets us practice in our dreams. All right, you get to practice with the power of God in your private time in prayer. You get to practice in private worship. You get to practice in your dreams. You get to practice on your family. You know, you get to practice on those in your household. You get to practice in, in, in basic things. All right, where are my keys? Let's see if the Holy Ghost will tell me where my keys are. All right, what's wrong with my car? Let's see if the Spirit of God will tell me what's wrong with my car. All right, what's my third grade teacher? Let's see if the Spirit of God will tell me, will remind me of that. All right, what's going on with this? Okay, which aisle is the milk on? They've rearranged the store. All right, Holy Ghost, where is the milk? Yeah, you get to practice. You Just you and the Lord, you're not operating in, in pride. You're trying to figure out, Spirit of God, what are you doing? Because I don't know the Spirit. I don't know things. I, I need to be taught. Spirit of God, teach me. And so the Lord lets the people of God practice. We know that church is another place where believers can practice because there are those of us that have responsibilities in church and we are empowered to operate in the anointing in the house of God. And then there are those who will have responsibilities 
outside of church. And that's an interesting reality right there, how the kingdom of God operates in the house of God. Please understand that the most important place is the church. So the church assembly is the most important gathering. It's the most important work. It's the most important service. It's the most powerful. It's the most necessary. When your political officials meet, that's not as important as when it's church time. So when the believers gather together to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, that is the most important event that occurs uh, day, daily and weekly. That, and that So the worship service is the most important operation. It's the most powerful work. It's the most necessary thing. It's, it's, it's more valuable to God that those moments of, of worship where the believers come together and they worship the Lord. The word of God is preached. The work of God, it goes on. The Lord will work more actively in church than he will anywhere on the planet. Any work he does outside of the church, he will do in the church. The work he does outside of the church is for the purpose of doing that work in the church because the most important, the most necessary, the greatest purpose of man is worship. The greatest purpose of man is worship. So there's nothing more valuable, more valid, greater than when man worships God in a direct way. That's praise, worship, bowing, clapping. So that is more important than any miracle. That's more important than anything. Man is supposed to worship God. Worshiping God is the most important thing that people do on the planet. All right. And then, then after that, we hear the word of God. You know, so that this is important. And then after that, you work the works of God. You work the works of God. So you worship and you serve God in that order. That's what the word of God says. That's what Jesus said. He said that in the word of God, you should worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So the morning and the evening sacrifice, we know that the most powerful tribe under the old covenant was the Levites. The, the Levites, that tribe was more, uh, they had more access to God than every other tribe. The tribe of Judah was also a special tribe. Why? Because through that tribe, the Messiah would come. And who, and who is the Messiah? He is the savior of the world. And what's his job? His job is to bring man back to full reconciliation and restoration with Father God so that they can worship him. That's what it says in Revelation 4, 11. We were created to worship God. We were created to worship the Son of God. We were created to worship Almighty God. And so Jesus purifies us, teaches us how to operate in that purity, teaches us how to purify others so that our worship is accepted. We learned that in Genesis 4, that either your worship is accepted or your worship is despised by the Lord. So we don't want our worship to be despised. Jesus has to teach us how to operate in a way that our worship is accepted. And so the church is a place where the believers consistently gather to worship and to serve God. And as the Lord has us work beyond the walls of the church, what we do outside of the church is also done in the church. So preaching is done outside of the church because it's done in the church. Healing is done outside of the church because it's done in the church. So all of the works that are done outside of the four walls of the church are supposed to be going on in the four walls of the church. So the church is a place where the Lord raises up his sons and daughters so that they can work in the church and beyond the world. The church is the home of the believers like the home is the center of every society. So the individual home, that person's apartment, that person's house, the individual home is the seat of every society. Well, the church is the seat of the planet. All right. It's where God dwells. It's where the people of God dwell. And it doesn't mean that God dwells there in his fullness. He dwells in heaven in his fullness. But other than heaven in the physical world, the, the, the church where the believers consistently and constantly gather in his name, he manifests most brightly and more great and, 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 and more greatly. And so God is teaching Moses how to 
operate in the power. The Spirit of God wants to teach you how to operate in the power. He wants to teach you how to operate in the Holy Ghost. And so he doesn't just want to give you power. He wants to teach you how to operate in the power. What's the problem? One of the major problems in our generation, in our day, is that many people are being taught how to operate in the power of prophecy and the miraculous, but they're not being taught repentance. They're not being taught righteousness. And so God wants you to, op wants you to operate in the power in righteousness. He wants you to operate in the power in spirit and in truth. And so Moses doubts his capacity. He doesn't think that the miraculous is able to convince the people. He doesn't believe the power of God on him is able to lead these people out of Egypt. Moses thinks that Pharaoh is too strong. Moses thinks that he's too old. He thinks his speech isn't convincing enough. The Spirit of God is telling Moses that he is going to be with him. Verse 4 says, verse 10 says this, Exodus 4 verse 10 says this, and Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since you've spoken to your servant, but I am slow, I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord, haven't I made man's mouth? Aren't I the one that determines the impact of your decisions? Don't I create people? Aren't I in control of their capacities, of their faculties? Don't I do what is done? Everything, everything done, I do. So I know what the deaf can do. I know what the dumb can do. I know what the illiterate can do. I know what the blind can do. Moses, the Lord is telling Moses, your experiences are not teaching you anything. That is is amazing. The Spirit of God is telling Moses, your experiences are not teaching you anything. Now, that's a hard truth. It's a hard saying. Many, as they'd say in the world, it's a hard pill to swallow. Many don't want to accept the fact that their experiences are not teaching them anything. The Spirit of God is calling man a liar. He's calling man's He's, what he's saying to man is that you, what you are learning from your experiences is wrong. Now, that's a huge aspect of walking in your calling. In, in order to walk in the call of God on your life, you must confess and believe that your way, your beliefs, your understanding of your world is wrong. You are wrong. You are wrong because you've lived in the world. You've lived a worldly, carnal life. You've not lived by faith. You've not lived by justice. You've not lived by the knowledge and power of the Spirit of God. You are wrong. You are wrong. It doesn't matter what your 80 years of experience have taught you. You've learned the wrong lesson. Yes, you think you know. The news thought it told you. You thought you learned that from the news. Many people who say they grew up in church didn't actually grow up in a healthy church. Many people who believe they grew up in a Christian home didn't grow up in a home healthy enough to convey the Christian truth, to reveal Jesus. Christianity is a revelation of Jesus. Christianity is a revelation of Jesus. And so we get to see Jesus through Christianity. That's what we get to see. And Jesus says, if you see me, you are seeing my father. So Jesus came to end the confusion about who God is and what God wants. And he came in the image of God, yet in the image of man. So he came doing the works of God, manifesting the mannerisms of Father God, speaking the words of Father God. That's what he came to do. That's what he came to do. So he came to reveal to us that our beliefs are 
corrupt, messed up. Jesus came to reveal the fact that you are wrong. You understand things the wrong way. You're broken. You, you misunderstand your experiences. In order to walk in the call of God on your life, you've got to confess that. You've got to renounce your beliefs. What you believe about yesterday, what you believe about mankind, what you believe can happen, what you believe will happen, your perspective, your view, your thoughts, your mind is wrong. I want to tell you what happened yesterday, if the Lord lets me. So yesterday, I was here in prayer, and as I was in prayer, I began to have some bad thoughts about some of the brothers, about a particular sister in the Lord. I began to have bad thoughts about her. And by bad thoughts, I mean I began to have thoughts that were telling me that she was going to fall into sin. This sister right here is not godly. She's going to fall into sin. She's not to be trusted. She's not to be um, developed. Do not, do, do not invest in this sister because she's going to fall into sin. And so as I'm in prayer, I began to have those thoughts, images of her falling into sin, operating in sinful ways. And I began to get discouraged and I began to get sad and I began to say, but Lord, she's not that way. She's not that way. And then the thoughts just came like, no, yeah, she's that way. She's that way. She's going to fall into sin. And so I, I just talked to the Lord a little bit. I said, Lord, but, you know, what, what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And I, and, I, and I said, Lord, I don't believe that. I don't, I, don't believe that that's, I don't believe that's you. I'm not sure that that's you. And so I just continued to pray. And within seconds, here's my stuff. Within seconds, the Lord... <laughs> put a thought in my mind within seconds the Lord put a thought in my mind and this is this is these are the words that I saw just like this all right the Lord put a thought in my mind and this is this is the words that I saw Now, everything was black and the letters were white, but that, those are the words that I saw. So I'm telling the Lord, Lord, I don't think these thoughts are from you. The very next statement the Lord made was he said this. And when he said this, because my head was down on my desk, when he said that, I thought to myself, the next thing that came into my mind was an image of my iPad. And in my mind, I saw it on I saw it on the table. I saw the iPad. In my, I just saw the iPad because I was laying down like this. I saw the iPad here on the table in my mind. And I thought to myself, before I open my eyes, I'm sure that when I open, or I, I bet when I open my eyes, I see that iPad right by my head. And I open my eyes and right by my head, I see my iPad. Right by my head. Like, so my, I'm, I'm, I'm laying down on the desk and I see this iP and, and I see the iPad in my mind. And I said, I bet the iPad is right there. And I opened my eyes and the iPad is right there. The Lord was saying this. He said, listen. He said, your technological devices, though we use them in our world for basic things like preaching the gospel and answering phone calls. Uh, though our technological devices are instruments of purpose. He was letting me know that when you have these devices, you are not to have these things on you. That's why Brother David has warned you, brothers and sisters, about the Apple watches. You know, that's why we, you know, we wear old, I, you know, I wear old watch, you know, a, you know, a watch like a, a watch because you don't need the technology on you because the 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 systems are demonic. The technological systems, the artificial intelligence is demonic, all right? And so they've consulted with demon spirits to come up with the technological advancements that they have over the last 50 and 60 years. So yes, while I can use it, I can use the phone. I can use the phone. I'm not walking around with a, a Bluetooth device in my ear. I'm not walking around with my phone in my pocket all the time. And when you sleep, you don't want the thing by your head. You don't want it by your head when you're sleeping. And when you're praying, you don't want it near your head. 
You don't want it near your your head. You know, I use the I use the iPad to I use the phone to play music through the Bluetooth speaker. You put it away. Put it over there. Put it over there. They are projecting communication through these devices. They are not your friends. All right. You 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 don't talk about your devices as though you love them, as though they're part of the family, as though they're near and dear to you. They are instruments of purpose. They are demonic little structures that the Lord gives us jurisdiction to utilize for basic purposes of communication. And that's all that they use for. They're not here to be your friend. You don't, you know what I mean? You don't take pictures with your phone and you don't celebrate the new outcomings of the new phone. Oh, the iPhone 14 is coming out. Oh, the I, you know, the Samsung Galaxy, whatever is coming out. The Lord told me years ago when I had an, an Android device, you love aliens. I said, how do I love aliens? How do I love aliens? It took me years for the Spirit of God to, exp to reveal to me in my head how I love aliens. And you love the technolo technology. You love aliens. All right. The aliens are giving the technolo technology creators aliens. The Lord showed me that the technology people are opening portals. He op opening portals to your house, opening portals to your society for demons through technology. So we're grateful that God enables us to use these things, but at the same time, these things are uh, they 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 are evil, and so you've got to manage your usage of them. Again, you don't wear them on your wrist. You don't wear your Google glasses. You don't wear these things. You don't wear it. You don't wear it. You put it over there. If you use it for work, you know, you have it on your hip and then you, you know, you, 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 you get rid of it as soon as you get home. We're not to do that, brothers. And so the Lord showed me that. The Lord showed me how my, how, how I was getting false dreams, false prophecy in my head. That's why it says in John, believe not every spirit. It says, don't believe every spirit. It says, try them, try the spirits. Meaning try your spiritual, or test your spiritual experiences. Don't believe every spirit. It says, try them whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Moses is having an actual encounter. And, and yes, Sister Yamara, we, the, the brothers and sisters here at Jesus Ministries, we barbecued our Apple watches. We barbecued our Apple watches. We got rid of our Apple watches. And so one of the things that we realize is that you can have either a good encounter with the Spirit of God or you can have a bad encounter uh, uh, with demons. So you're either encountering the Spirit of God or you are encountering demons. And so as a called man, as a called woman, we have to effectively uh, be in the world, but not of the world. We have to be in the world, but we cannot be of the world. You can be in your world, but you can't be of your world. Yes, you're going to use Caesar's currency. Yes, you're going to use Steve Jobs' devices and Mark Zuckerberg's platforms, but you're not going to become, you're not going to accept, you don't love the devices. You don't love these things. You love Jesus and you're grateful for the things that he gives you. So as you enter into the call of God for your life, what we're, what we're doing is we're growing in the knowledge of the Spirit of God. We're growing in the nature. We're growing in the knowledge. We're growing in the power of the Spirit of God. And the Lord has to convince us that our experiences have not taught us heavenly things unless our experiences were heavenly. Unless we were encountering the Spirit of God, your traditions, your natural experiences, do not teach you what heaven needs to teach you, what Jesus is trying to teach you. Jesus said, I am sending the comforter and he will teach you all things. So Moses is relying on his experience to consider his future. 
You cannot rely on your understanding of how your physical world works. You can't trust your experience. You can't trust the experience of carnal minded people, even if they've gone before you, even if they're older than you are, if they've got more experience in preaching, if they've got more experience in prayer. It doesn't matter. If we are not encountering the Spirit of God, then we are not being transformed. We're not being reborn. We're not being taught. We are not understanding what God is saying. It doesn't matter. If the Lord is not revealing himself to you, you are not understanding your world. Your world, the, the word of God says that. We talked about that in, uh, let's see. We talked about that in Isaiah, oh, I'm sorry, in Ezekiel. Well, yes, Isaiah 55. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, nor your ways my ways. And then... We have this passage here in Ecclesiastes 8, going into chapter 9. It says this in verse 16. This is Ecclesiastes 8, 16. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on the earth, for also there is, there are people that neither day nor night sees, sees sleep with his eyes. Then I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun because though a man labor to seek it out, yet will he not find it. Yes, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet will he not be able to find it. So it's saying that no matter how wise you think you are in your flesh, it's saying you cannot know what's going on in earth. It's saying you cannot understand what is happening in your world unless the Spirit of God is talking to you. So it's saying that your experiences have not taught you. That's what it's saying. It's saying your experiences have not taught you. You are not understanding how your world works. And then it says this in chapter 9, verse 1, For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knows either love or hatred by all that is before him. It's saying you've, lear you've learned wrong from your experiences. You don't know what's happening. That's why we have to meditate in the word of God day and night. Because you don't know what is happening. You don't know what's going to happen based on your human experiences, your carnal experiences, your natural senses, your five senses, your sixth sense isn't a clear view. It is not a clear view. So Moses says, I can't accomplish the work that you are telling me to accomplish, Lord. I can't do it because I'm not eloquent. They aren't going to believe me. Moses, why wouldn't the elders believe you? Because it's unlikely. It's unlikely. And then he would have to consider the natural facts. Well, naturally speaking, they haven't heard from me in 40 years. I'm an 80-year-old man. They're afraid of Pharaoh. I don't have the money. I don't have the military. I don't have the influence to get Pharaoh to make any decisions. I'm not wealthy. These people, why would they listen to me? So in order to doubt God, please understand, please understand. You need to come to one conclusion at least. In order to doubt God, you have to focus on the natural, on nature, on the physical world. You, are, you cannot doubt God. You cannot tell God. You can't call God a liar unless you are focusing on the natural world. So, so your physical environment is so convincing to you. You are so, we are so persuaded by nature and its laws that we don't believe God and we don't press into the call of God on our lives. So if the spirit of God tells us that we can go to Egypt and deliver the Hebrews from Pharaoh by following God's instruction, in order to doubt God, you'd have to reference nature. In order to doubt God, you have to reference nature. 
If God tells you that he wants to do something, in order to doubt him, you have to think about something natural, some natural law, some natural structure, some natural condition, some natural repetition or repetitive, uh, some natural cycle. You would have to absolutely. So we are constantly comparing the physical with the spiritual and we are locked in to the physical. We're locked in uh, because of unbelief, because of the curse. The curse on our lives positions us to believe the physical above the spirit, to believe man above God, to believe sickness, to believe nature and how it works, the laws of nature, earth and space, science, your feelings. Absolutely. We are more conditioned to believe the physical world above the spirit. And if the spit now, if the spirit of God is making you a promise, you're supposed to commit your emotions and your thoughts to that. You're supposed to say, well, if the spirit of God is saying this, I believe him above nature. I believe him above my past experiences. Moses is 80 years old. He's 80 years old and he's a, he has 80 years worth of human experiences at very high levels. He's a prince of Egypt and now he's the son-in-law of the priest of Midian. He's had lots of natural and, and spiritual experiences and he's wrong at this stage of his life. He's wrong. God is telling him things can work differently. Things can operate differently. I can come into your world and things can work completely different. That is what he wants you to know. God is saying, listen, if I manifest, I can make things different. So when we talk about the miraculous, listen, we're not talking about the frivolous. There's a big difference between the miraculous and the frivolous. The frivolous is when things are, are done that don't work the purposes of the spirit of Jesus. Jesus has work to do. Jesus has work to do. And the world doesn't let Jesus work. So he has to work it. He has to break it. Hey, I want this done. The world says, well, those laws are not op th That doesn't happen. So Jesus just operates. He just walks on water. He just feeds 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. 5,000 plus. We're talking about maybe 10,000 people. It's only counting the men. It's not in counting the women and the children. So you're talking about at least double the amount. With five loaves and two fish. He's feeding 4,000 plus with, four lo with, 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 with seven loaves and, 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 and some fish. And three fish, I forget how many of the fish there were. But what is he doing? He's not, and he's not breaking the laws of nature. Jesus is not breaking the laws of nature. He's, he, okay, so I, I want to I wanna show you a scripture that hopefully you like. Hope, hopefully you like this scripture. And if you don't, you need to learn to like it. The Spirit of God says something to Job. In Job, maybe it's Job 38. Very, very powerful statement here. The Spirit of God says to Job, uh, uh, yes, yeah, right here. And the, Lord, and the Lord says this to Job in Job 38, 33. Know you the ordinances of heaven? Can you set the dominion of it in the earth? Know you the ordinances of heaven? And can you set the dominion of it in the earth? And that's one of at least two times he asked him that directly. Do you know the laws of heaven? Can you make, can, can you, and, and if he didn't say it there in this statement, another person mentioned that and talked about the way, and it was amazing. It was amazing how the spirit of God, how the spirit of God, Introduced that as a reality. Hey, listen, there are laws. So there are laws, there are natural laws, and there are spiritual laws. So when Jesus preaches repentance, he's not simply saying, don't fornicate, don't fight, don't curse, don't steal. 
He is saying those are the ways of the fallen world, but they're ways of holy heaven. He wants to reveal holiness unto heaven, brothers. We're talking about holiness unto heaven. We're not talking about holiness unto uh, inactivity. See, vain religion will tell you to be holy, but they're not telling you that you're going to have dominion in 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 it. In exchange. Listen, let me say something about Roman Catholicism. If the Roman Catholic laws said, hey, listen, hi, uh, priests, don't get married, all right? You, we need you to stay at the Catholic Church, and we need you to read these writings from old fathers, Catholic fathers, and we, and we need you to not have a wife and kids and live off of the church offering in a very limited way. We want you to live that way. And if you do this, when people come into these Catholic church doors, if they have demons, the demons are going to flee from them. And all of the works of Jesus that are available to you are going to be constant in this place. If you abstain from a wife and you don't have kids and you don't uh, do all kind of things that the rock stars of the world do. If you just sit here, hey, listen, we have a convent. We call it a convent. It's a place where nuns live and they serve the work of the Catholic purposes. Yeah, and these women here, and they don't have husbands and kids. Listen, ladies, if you give up a life of marriage and kids and world exploration and you sit here in this convent and you all just seek God, listen, your, 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 your city, if poverty is everywhere, it won't be in your city. If sickness is everywhere, it won't be in your city. God will visit you all progressively, daily, in power and knowledge. And, and when you ladies do leave your convent and go to the stores, the aroma of heaven will follow you wherever you go. Then fine, 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 fine. Yeah, then you, you know, oh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, when she used to go to Calcutta, India, the leprosy was healed. She just walked past and, and curses were broken and the Hindu statues would fall down. Great, great. If that's what they're offering you, that's not what false religion is offering you. False religion is not offering you power. Jesus says, Jesus says, you need to repent because you have kingdom identity and kingdom responsibility and kingdom rewards. He says, listen, turn from sin and rebellion so that I can make you a king and a priest. He's made us unto our gods, kings and priests. What did the disciples stand to gain for repentance? Peter, if he's going to leave all of these fish he just caught, if he's going to leave his wife, what is Peter going to get in exchange? Is Peter just going to walk around in long robes with his hands clasped to communicate piety and and temperance that's not no 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 we're not talking about hindu gurus and roman catholic priests and buddhist monks being so holy that they're immobile that's not what jesus is talking about jesus is not telling us to practice sitting down with our hands clasped and legs crossed and 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 empty rooms so that we can gain control of our minds. Jesus is talking about the sanctification of his spirit, meaning I'm going to sanctify you and send you to have dominion because the devil is running amok. He's running your world. The curse is running your world. I, God, have cursed your world with death and destruction because you all rebelled against me and I want to fix that generationally until I come. That's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, your world is run by a murderer. The devil is a murderer. He makes us sick. He makes us afraid. He poisoned us. He attacked us. He bound us. He got us into trouble. He gets us into trouble and then mocks us and then tells us that God won't accept us. He needs to be confronted. How do you confront the devil? We're not here to ignore the devil. We're here to confront the devil. And we're not here to confront the devil by our human will or human might. We're here to confront the devil by the Spirit of God, by the power of the Spirit of God, by Jesus Jesus said, in my name, you're going to remove devils. You're going to cast out devils. You're going to make them go. They have to go. You have to make them go. And only Jesus can give you the power to make the devils go. You have to embrace Jesus to make the devils go. So repentance isn't 
for the purpose of immobility. Holiness is not you being a statue. Holiness is not you being a statue. Listen, if you are giving up one thing, it's to gain other things. That's reality. So if you're putting down cigarettes, if you're putting down drunkenness, if you're putting down lust and all types of evil, the Spirit of God is telling you, I'm going to give you things in exchange. Years ago, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I said, Lord, I had, you know, I had DVDs, DVDs, action DVDs, drama, comedy, and, I, and, and the Spirit of God did not outright tell me, David, your videos are evil. He didn't just outright tell me that. I felt like what I'm watching falls short of the glory of God. And, 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 and my pastors did not tell me what I was watching was evil. None of them disagreed with the things that I was watching or had in my video collection. And so here I am saved uh, and, and, and I, I'm committed to Jesus. I'm, 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 I'm trying to grow in the power of God and the knowledge of God and righteousness. And I look at my, and one day, I don't know what day it was. It must have been after service one day. I must have finished watching a video and I looked at my, I looked at my videos and I said, I said, Lord, if you, if you get rid of these DVDs, if, I said, Lord, if you get rid of these DVDs, I'll replace them with Jesus DVDs. Lord, Lord, if you give me DVDs, if you give me Jesus DVDs, I'll replace them. I'll replace these. And in my mind, I thought to myself, I don't know what that even is. I don't even know what that would be. I don't even know what Jesus videos would be about. Like, I didn't even know what, I just assumed that, Lord, if I get rid of these, would you replace them? Re replace my collection of videos. Re re replace this. Replace this, Lord. I must have been like 24, 23 years old, 24 years old. And he did. He did. He didn't take long to do that. So I didn't just, I didn't just grab my collection and throw it out. The Lord would lead me. He'd lead me, whether it was through some site or something. And, oh, look, oh, this preacher who's operating in truth and power, he's got videos. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to send away for some of his videos. And I would. And I, I'd, every, every time I'd get a DVD collection, I'd get rid of one. All right. Well, well, the Lord gave me this one. I'm getting rid of this one. David, why are you getting rid of that one? I don't know. I just think maybe it's less than what God wants me to watch. Maybe it's not what God wants me to watch. He told me after the fact about how bad it is. Don't you know there's some things you want to know right now? And God is saying, well, you, you won't obey command number one. You want to you want to know and you want to know revelation number 3, but revelation number 1 comes with obeying command number 1. Revelation number 2 comes with obeying command number 2. Revelation number 3 comes with obeying command number 3. You want to know revelation 1, but you can't obey command 1. And so when we obey, we are telling God that we are willing to handle revelation well. So what if God tells you things that nobody else knows? If you're a disobedient person, what are you going to do with revelation? So revelation is for manifestation of Jesus. If God reveals something to you, it's because he wants to reveal himself through you, brothers and sisters. If the Spirit of God reveals something to you, he wants to reveal himself through you. Sin hinders the revelation of Jesus through your body. And so righteousness enables revelation through your body. Righteousness is not so you can become a statue. Righteousness doesn't make you immobile. It doesn't make you still. Righteousness makes you Jesus. Jesus said, as my father has sent me, so send I you. Receive you the Holy Ghost. So we receive the Holy Ghost so we can be like Jesus. We are the body of Christ. We've got goals. We have goals. We have goals. And so we're not simply abstaining from sin. We're not simply abstaining from lust. We're walking in the kingdom. And you, you get to ask what that means and what that looks like and how that acts and operates from day to day. All right, Lord, 
You told me not to fight anybody today. What must I do? What, what must I do? Because I'm not going to fight anybody. I'm not going to steal anyone's car or money. Spirit of God, now what? What do I do with my time? And so it wasn't until I'm getting rid of the action movies. It wasn't until I was getting rid of the dramas. It wasn't until I was getting rid of the comedies. It wasn't until I was getting rid of the documentaries and God is, in, God is replacing my evil stuff with his good stuff. And I was amazed. I was surprised. Lord, I didn't know there were so many videos that could benefit me out here. Well, David, you didn't really have an appetite for it. So you wanted to watch those comedies and those dramas so because that's what your appetite was for. You love that. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Well, if my hunger and my thirst is after the world, that's what's going to satisfy me. You think Jesus wants to offer you something you turn up your nose at? You think the Lord wants to offer you something that you turn up your nose at? You think he wants to tell you, Revelation, that you're going to just sit on some shelf? No, the Spirit of God doesn't want to tell you something that you're going to despise or ignore. He wants to tell you something that you're going to use and utilize and walk in. If he really, listen, listen, L -l let me tell you something. So please excuse what I'm about to say. Please excuse what I'm about to say. One of the most boring chapters in your Bible is Numbers 7. Now, Numbers 7 is a very interesting passage. It's a very interesting passage. The 12 leaders of the 12 tribes wanted to come and offer something to the Lord. They wanted to offer a gift to the Lord. They all offered the same gift, and the Spirit of God saw fit to have Moses record verbatim what everyone offered, though it was the exact same gift. Now, I want to show you something. I want to show you something, and I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to read this to you, and if you don't have the patience, you're just not going to get the revelation. So, And, and, and so here we go. All right. All right. All right, so get ready, get ready. Numbers 7. And it came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and sanctified it and all the instruments of it, both the altar and the vessels of it, and had anointed them and sanctified them, that the princes of Israel, heads of the house of their fathers, who were the princes, princes of the tribes, and were over them that were numbered, offered. And they brought their offering before the Lord, six covered wagons and twelve oxen, a wagon for two of the princes, and for each one an ox. And they brought them before the tabernacle. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take it of them, that they may be to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And you will give them to the Levites, to every man according to his service. And Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon, according to their service. And four wagons and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari, according to their service, under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the, high, the priest. But to the sons of Kohath he, had, he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary belonging to them was that they should bear on, on their shoulders. And the princes offered for dedicating of the altar in the day that it was anointed. Even the princes offered their offering before the altar. And the Lord said to Moses, they will offer their offering, each prince on his day, for the dedicating of the altar. And he that offered his offering the first day was Nashan, the son of Amminadab, of the tribe of Judah. And his offering was one silver charger. The weight of it was 120, 130 shekels. One silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. Both of them are full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering. One spool, one spoon of 10 shekels of gold full of incense. One young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering. One kid of the goats for a sin offering. And for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Nashan, the son of Amenadab. 
On the second day, Nathaniel, the son of Zuar, prince of Issachar, did offer. He offered for his offering one silver charger. The weight of it was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one spoon, one spoon of gold of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Nathaniel, the son of Zuar. On the third day, Eliab, the son of Helan, prince of the children of Zebulun, did offer. His offering was one silver charger. The weight of it was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Eliah, the son of Helan, on the fourth day, uh, uh, on the fourth day, Eliza, the son of Sheduar, prince of the children of Reuben, did offer. His offering was one silver charger of the weight of 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Eliza, the son of Shaduar. On the fifth day, Shalumiel, the son of Zerushadai, prince of the children of Simeon, did offer. His offering was one silver charger. The weight of it was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour, mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Shalumiel, the son of Zerushadai. On the sixth day, Eliasaph, the son of Jewel, prince of the children of Gad offered. His offering was one silver charger of the weight of 130 shekels, a silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour, mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Eliasaph, the son of Jewel. On the seventh day, Elishama, the son of Amihud, prince of the children of Ephraim, offered. His offering was one silver charger. The weight of it was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering. One, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Elishama, the son of Amihud. On the eighth day, offered Gamaliel, the son of Pedazer, prince of the children of Manasseh. His offering was one silver charger of the weight of 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Gamaliel. Malik, the son of Pedazer. On the ninth day, Abidin, the son of Gideoni, prince of the children of Benjamin, offered. His offering was one silver charger. The weight of it was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five Five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Abidin, the son of Gideoni. On the tenth day, Ahiezer, the son of Amishadai, prince of the children of Dan, offered. 
His offering was one silver charger. The weight of it was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of, a, of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Ahiezer, the son of Amishadai. On the 11th day, Pagiel, the son of Okra, Prince of the children of Asher offered. His offering was one silver charger. The weight of it was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering. One golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Pagiel, the son of Okran. On the 12th day, Ahira, son of Enon, prince of the children of Naphtali, offered. His offering was one silver charger. The weight of it was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Ahira, son of Enon. This was the dedication of the altar in the day when it was anointed by the princes of Israel. Twelve charges of silver, twelve silver bowls, twelve spoons of gold, each charger of silver weighing 130 shekels each, each bowl 70, all the silver vessels weighed 2,400 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. The golden spoons were 12, full of incense, weighing 10 shekels apiece after the shekel of the sanctuary. All the gold of the spoons was 120 shekels. All the oxen for the burnt offering were 12 bullocks, the rams 12, the lambs of the first year 12, with their meat offering, and the kids of the goats for a sin offering 12. And all the oxen for the sacrifice of the peace offerings were 24 bullocks, the rams 60, the he goats 60, the lambs of the first year 60. This was the dedication of the altar after that it was anointed. And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking to him from off the mercy seat that was on the ark of testimony from between the cherubims. He spoke to him and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, when Aaron, speak to Aaron and say to him, when you light the lamps, the seven lamps will give light over against the candlestick. All of this builds up to the Spirit of God manifesting. The Lord says to Moses, I want you to write this down. I want you to take this. And he tediously goes through that. And at the end of it, he appears. At the end of it, he manifests. And he tells Moses something. It says, and when, and, when, and when Moses was going into the tabernacle, he heard the voice of the Lord speaking to him. So he walks him through this arduous counting and uh, and sorting everything out and then the, the Moses goes into the tabernacle to do what he normally does but now the spirit of God wants to speak to him and the Lord says something that seems very simple he says speak to Aaron and say this when you light the lamps the seven lamps will give their light over against the candlestick mind you the candlestick is a representation of the presence of God himself those candlesticks are representative of the people of God the church of God the spirits of God on the church just like Revelation chapter 1 through 4 the Lord is saying I want to I want to, I need you to, I want to, I want to kind of, I want to see, I want to see where you are. I want to see if you're sleepy. I want to see if you're bored. I want to see if your mind will shut off. And as soon as Moses is willing to go through the tedious, the Lord appears and Moses goes into the tabernacle, does not expect the spirit of God to be speaking to him. The Lord speaks to him and says, tell Aaron to light the candles like this. It'll radiate like this. What's that going to do? It's going to manifest the presence of God. It's going to manifest the presence of God. Do this and watch what I do. The Lord tells him secrets. He tells him secrets. This seems so uneventful. No, no, no. This is not, this is not uneventful. This is not uneventful. The Lord will take you through the repetition until he manifests. So 
we're not supposed to be deceived by the repetition of our world or the repetition of the commands of the Lord. We're supposed to understand. We're supposed to read with understanding and understanding includes anticipation. And when the Spirit of God speaks, he's teaching you how to gain and retain access. Let me tell you, after you've obeyed in these areas that seem uneventful, seem unimportant, seem insignificant, if you can obey and if you can walk with me in this, I can manifest to you. Because just you show that you're stable. You show that you're stable. So the Lord, as every time I read that, every time I read that, now I will agree since, you know, the, the Lord had me read it right now and you all are here. There's a faith that made that reading much more glorious than I've ever read it. But... I'm telling you right now, the Holy Ghost knows how to prepare you for a visitation. He knows how to prepare you for a visitation. And those who don't have the stomach for that, they don't have the appetite for that, they don't have the love for that, they can go. Because they make the manifestation more difficult to receive. But for those that are hungry and thirsty enough to wait, then when he appears, he appears in power. He appears in power. And when he comes, he comes to give you dominion. He comes to teach you the ordinances of heaven. And he comes to give you the right to set the dominion of it in the earth. And that's what we're waiting for. That's what we wait for. That's what we're looking for. And so praise the Lord for your life. Praise the Lord for your mind as you are committing yourself to Jesus Christ. Do not be weary and well-doing for you will reap if you faint not.